presentation event for today. Uh, we're very uh, pleased and honored to have Thomas Moser, who is an alternative member of the governing board at the SMB. Thomas Moser received his doctorate in economics from the University of Zurich. He was a teaching and research assistant at the University of Zurich's Institute for Empirical Research in Economics and an economist at the Kauf uh, Swiss Economic Institute for Business Cycle Research at the ETH Zurich before joining the Swiss National Bank in 1999. Uh, from 2001 to 2004, uh, Thomas was an advisor and then senior advisor to the Swiss Executive Director at the IMF in Washington, D.C. And then from 2006 to 2009, he was Executive Director at the IMF, representing Swiss Life constituency. Since 2010, Thomas Moser is an alternative member of the governing board of the Swiss National Bank. He's also head of economic affairs. And today he will be uh, talking, uh, addressing the topic of the SMB's approach to monetary policy, conventional and unconventional. Um, in December 1999, uh, the Swiss National Bank abandoned monetary targeting and introduced a new monetary policy strategy. The new framework proved successful and even displayed some advantages over the other frameworks in the early stages of the recent financial crisis. Like other central banks, the SMB had to complement its conventional monetary policy within unconventional measures. Since September 2011, the SMB set a minimum exchange rate against the euro. In an environment with short-term interest rates at zero, this allows the SMB to ensure monetary conditions that are appropriate for the Swiss economy. Uh, I think that now um, Thomas is going to address both the current policy and what the prospects are for uh, the continuation of that. Uh, so thank you very much. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Would, I mean, it would be nicer to be above the clouds rather than in the clouds, but I guess it's a good start to, to be here in the clouds. So I will talk about uh, the Swiss National Bank and its monetary policy. At the IMF, the saying was that uh, before the Asian crisis, no one really knew the difference between the World Bank and the IMF and so on. After the Asian crisis, the IMF became very well known, mainly because of the heavy criticism that the IMF got for uh, how it handled the Asian crisis. And it's a little bit similar now with the, with the central banks. They have become very known now. Before the crisis, a lot of people didn't really know the difference between commercial banks and central banks. Now I think the difference is very clear. Uh, and I know this is not the case for you all financial uh, specialists, but uh, at least in the, uh, in the public at large. So I intend to say something about uh, the Swiss uh, National Bank's monetary policy approach or, or framework. I talk first about the conventional monetary policy uh, as it was uh, adopted with the new monetary policy uh, strategy in 2000 and how it had to be changed in reaction uh, to the crisis. So starting with the basics, so if you look first at the mandate that the Swiss National Bank has, uh, I think that it's, it's, uh, it, it's very interesting if you compare that with what other central banks have. And I think one thing that you will notice very quickly is that uh, there is a lot of pragmatism and flexibility in the mandate of the Swiss National Bank. And that's usually a surprise if you talk to people abroad, because they always view the Swiss National Bank together with the Bundesbank. It's one of these very stability, price stability oriented uh, central banks. And the, the teaching has been that you need to have a very clear uh, framework, a very rigid, clear framework. But that has not been the case, actually, for the Swiss National Bank. And if you look first at the, the Constitution, then this is a very general sentence. It says, as an independent central bank, I mean, I think this is important, the independence is in there, the Swiss National Bank shall follow a monetary policy which serves the general interest of the country, which can be a lot of things. And then if you go into the law, then you see it says, first it repeats the same thing again, uh, the country as a whole, and then it says it, sh it shall ensure price stability. Uh, it, in, do, in so doing, it shall take due account of the development of the economy. And here, uh, I think one of the differences here is that unlike in the United States, where you have a, a dual mandate, where the real economy and price stability are basically on the same level, and unlike 
in the uh, monetary in the European Monetary Union, where the ECB has a, a single target, the price stability. Again, here you have a, a nice Swiss compromise where you have both both objectives in there, but you have a hierarchy. So price stability comes first. If that's, that is taken care of, then you can uh, take into account the, the, the real side of the economy. So I think this again is uh, relatively special, but it gives you again quite a lot of uh, flexibility. Now, this is the mandate that we received from, the, from, uh, from Parliament, and this is what the Swiss National Bank then made out of it. Uh, that's the monetary policy strategy in place since 2000. Uh, first of all, since in the law it just says uh, it shall ensure price stability, this is also uh, quite different from other countries where you have uh, clearly defined what price stability is already in the law. This is not the case in, in Switzerland, so it was up to the Swiss National Bank. It had the freedom to define itself what it understands on the price stability and the, the definition that we gave ourselves is that basically anything between zero and two percent. Uh, CPI, anything between zero and two percent. This is also, again, uh, a proof of, of some kind of pragmatism. Uh, it is uh, our clear understanding that we are not able to fine tune uh, inflation enough that we could say it's always at 2%, it's always at 1%, or it's close to 2%. Basically, we are happy with anything between 0 and 2, given that we are not able to fine-tune uh, inflation uh, to, a, to a larger extent. And then we use as a main indicator uh, our medium-term inflation forecast, and that's a slight difference. We always had big discussions with the IMF. We always said we are not an inflation targeter. And one thing here is that we are not targeting the inflation forecast. We, we take it as an indicator, but we also look at other things, including uh, uh, monetary aggregates and a lot of indicators. But this is clearly our main indicator. But also here we have not like a, a classic inflation targeter that we, that we say this is our inflation target, that's how long we can deviate from the target, that's how quickly we have to come back. Again here, uh, a lot of flexibility and pragmatism. And then finally also, I think, I think something that is uh, quite special, our operational target, how we implement monetary policy is like other central banks with an interest rate, but most other central banks use an overnight interest rate to do that, and because an overnight interest rate they can, they can control very tightly, or they have an interest rate that they set themselves. In the case of the Swiss National Bank, the operational target is the three-month flybor. And this also, when the concept came out that in 2000 or 1999, when it became clear that this will be the concept, a lot of questions were asked. And the, for instance, the IMF too, in the Article 4 discussions with Switzerland, wondered whether the Swiss National Bank would be able to control the three-month LIBOR. That's an interest rate that's set in London. Uh, it's relatively a long term for a central bank, and they, they seriously doubted that it would be possible to, to target or to, to steer the LIBOR uh, precisely enough. And it turned out the experience, uh, it, went, it went quite well. And it was mentioned before that in the, during this crisis, in the early stages of the crisis, it actually even had some advantages. This is one of the things, uh, the implementation of monetary policy, no one really cared about it too much. I mean, there were some specialists, I have looked into it, they thought strange what the Swiss National Bank is doing here. It seemed to work, then everyone forgot about it. Then the crisis came and the, this difference suddenly became again uh, important. And in the, in the Swiss case, it was important in the sense that in the early stages of the crisis, in uh, 2007, you had these uh, risk spreads uh, starting to increase. And what that meant for the Swiss National Bank is given that our operational target is to keep the, the LIBOR at a certain level, when these risk spreads began to increase, that meant basically that with overnight rates, we had to become more expansionary in a sense. So that's, that's for instance, again, one thing that was said, it was the Swiss National Bank is becoming more expansionary. And we said that's not the case because our operational target is the LIBOR, so we didn't change our monetary policy stance. But the effect was as if, for instance, the ECB would have become more expansionary. So we had like a built-in uh, built mechanism that reacted to the, 
to the increase in the risk spreads. And I think that was to the advantage of the Swiss National Bank. We didn't have to have a specific uh, policy decision to lower our overnight rates, for instance, because it was automatic, it was built into the system, which was an advantage. Uh, that was not something that was intended when the framework was created, but it turned out to be an advantage when the crisis started. So I think there are some, some, some specificities about the monetary policy strategy of Switzerland that served us well. It gives us a lot of flexibility, which is a surprise to, to some people when they look at it, but it, it worked out quite well. It was not sufficient, and I will come to that, because we had to uh, then uh, take additional measures uh, during the crisis. But let's look now first uh, just a, a rough glance at the uh, inflation performance uh, of uh, Switzerland. And I think, is, as I said, to have, we have, uh, for instance, the Fed has this dual mandate, but what is clear is that for all central banks, price stability is something that is important and, and the inflation performance is something uh, for which the central bank is uh, responsible. And if you look at the, I took here a very long series since 1925, and you see also the different monetary uh, regimes that Switzerland went through roughly up to uh, 74 uh, fixed exchange rates. And then in 1974, the Swiss National Bank, together with the Bundesbank, uh, led the revolution to monetary targeting. And that phase lasted for Switzerland relatively long until, uh, until 2000, when then the current system came into place. But I think one, one thing that you can see is that the inflation performance got better over time. You have uh, certain peaks, of course, World War uh, II afterwards. You have the big peak in inflation up to 15%. Uh, These are annual inflation rates. Then you have in the 70s, you have a peak over 10%. You have, again, in the 80s and mid-90s uh, inflation rates above 5%. But since then, uh, relatively narrow uh, inflation rates. Now, this is true not only for the Swiss National Bank. You also have for other central banks, not the countries that the inflation performance improved over time. But I think what is still true is for Switzerland is that we have, if you compare it now here with US inflation and Euro area inflation, that inflation in Switzerland has generally been lower than in uh, other countries. Now, as I said, we had, this was the, the way inflation, uh, monetary policy worked in, uh, in <laughs> Switzerland. It worked quite well and then came the crisis. Uh, here again to remind what a dramatic impact that was. That's world real GDP and this, uh, this very significant drop it took in uh, 2000, end of 2008. Uh, we had a recovery but given the drop that we had uh, in a normal uh, recovery you would after the drop you would see uh, growth rates uh, much higher than before to catch up again. This catch up did not happen on the contrary we had again uh, faltering growth rates and uh, a very weak recovery. Now this is for the world economy as a whole. If you look at Switzerland, it looks, it looks very similar. So there's not much difference in terms of the, of the economic performance of the Swiss economy. Now one difference from uh, other countries is that Switzerland had the problem of, a, or still has the problem of, a, a very strong Swiss franc. And the reason is that the Swiss franc is uh, serving as a safe haven. And you see that very often that when there is a crisis somewhere, uh, that the Swiss franc uh, gets stronger. And that, that's when I joined the Swiss National Bank the first time in 1999, that was usually the saying is, Swiss franc gets strong, what's happening? And I remember very well, for instance, 2001, 9-11, that's exactly what, what happened. After lunch, suddenly Swiss franc becomes very strong. First question is, what's happening? And we go to the news, and then we see that, that there is something, uh, some risk event in the world, and uh, which increases the demand for the Swiss franc. You also see on this chart, this is now the, uh, the real exchange rate export weighted. You see very well that uh, and, and the line you see is a long-term average. You see very well during the phase that has been called the Great Moderation, starting around 2003, lasting up to the crisis. Uh, this was a time when a lot of people said, 
there will be no more financial crisis. Uh, we will certainly not have any crisis in the advanced countries. Emerging countries, they are all uh, graduating, becoming advanced countries. Uh, and so also the demand for, for the Swiss franc as a safe haven was faltering. And a lot of people asked uh, whether the Swiss franc still has this safe haven role. And it was clearly not in demand. And you see the Swiss franc was relatively weak uh, compared with the average uh, in the years right before the crisis. But then when the crisis started in 2007, uh, there was a dram dramatic uh, strengthening of the Swiss franc. And uh, especially uh, this uh, extreme movement uh, in the summer of 2011. And that's when then the Swiss National Bank, and I will come back to that, had to set this minimum exchange rate or, or, had to, or started to do foreign exchange interventions. Actually, foreign exchange interventions started already earlier, already in 2009. Uh, but a different concept than, was, than it was taken then when, the, when basically an exchange rate ceiling or floor, however you look at it, was set in 2011. But uh, with this chart again uh, basically shows you how extreme these movements were. And this is monthly data. So the, the, the peak there was quite extreme if you go to the, if you would have daily data for such an index uh, or even during the intraday the day when we, we had to uh, react these were extreme movements. So this was a little bit special for Switzerland but I think what was general for all central banks that they uh, that the shock of this uh, great recession was so large that that they all uh, became extremely expansionary because one of the lessons uh, of the Great Depression was, uh, or at least that's what we think it is, one of the lessons that the, the central banks were not expansionary enough. And that was clearly different uh, this time around, but it also led to the fact that we are all now in uh, uncharted territory, not voluntarily, but we are clearly have a situation that, uh, that is unprecedented. That's true for all central banks. Thanks. And uh, given the very uh, expansionary monetary policy, uh, all central banks came into a situation where they reached the so-called zero low bound, where their interest rates that they use as a policy rate uh, came to zero and it was not possible to, to lower it further. If you there are certain uh, monetary policy rules, simple, for instance, a Taylor rule that, that show you how expansionary your monetary policy should be. And when you took that Taylor rule, certainly in 2012, then it showed you that you should go away, that you should have negative interest rates, which is not very well possible. I mean, there are certain ways to do it, but it's not uh, necessarily to be recommended. But basically, uh, what it showed us that even interest rates at zero are not low enough. Uh, and, and as you can see here, these are the different official interest rates of different countries. You see they all reacted uh, quite strongly uh, in reaction to the crisis. In red, you see uh, the, the Swiss case. And here, keep in mind that unlike other central banks, for all other central banks, this policy rate is an overnight rate. For the Swiss National Bank, it's a three-month rate. So when we are at the same level, we are much more expansionary with a three-month rate than other countries are with an overnight rate. And you also see from this chart, we are the only ones who really went to zero. The three-month LIBOR is uh, around two basis points. So I mean, you cannot really go much further. And there were questions, and still there are some questions among central banks, whether, they, whether it is technically possible to go so low. And you see that other central banks uh, stayed at 25 basis points or even higher, also out of fear or out of uh, uh, concerns that, uh, that it might not be advisable or even possible to go further. And we had similar discussions in 2009 when you reached 25 basis points. There were also a, a sense that we reached a zero lower bound. But then during the dramatic months uh, in summer of 2011, uh, it became clear that it's po it is possible to go uh, to zero, but only under a, with extreme uh, measures. And here again, the Swiss case. Before, uh, what I didn't mention, uh, but you probably uh, know anyway, is that the way we use the, the three-month LIBOR as an operational target is that we set a, a band around it. So we are not saying that we want to have the three-month LIBOR at 1%, uh, at for instance, but we always had a 100 basis points band around it. And the reason for that is exactly because it is a three-month rate and we cannot, we cannot set it. We have to influence it through our report transactions 
conditions. Uh, but we need that, that, uh, that band because we cannot so exactly uh, steer it. And uh, as you can see here, in 2008, when the crisis was underway, we lowered it dramatically. And in 2009, uh, our, the band that we set came to zero, so the, the band was from one uh, from zero to one percent, and then the way we proceeded is just to take the upper band uh, further down, and right now the band is only at uh, 25 basis points itself, while the LIBOR itself is at, uh, at zero. Here again you have now this time as a nominal um, bilateral rates, you have the Swiss franc euro, uh, in red, uh, with the scale on the on the right, and you have the Swiss franc uh, against the U.S. dollar on the left in blue, and here again you see these dramatic movements that we had, uh, especially in the summer months of uh, 2011. So then we came. Uh, what what we uh, we had the situation we had in summer of two th in summer of 2011 was that we had a strengthening of the Swiss franc before we had intervened in the foreign exchange markets in 2009 and in the first part of 2010. In 2010, it looked like the recovery was on the way. Uh, rel relatively uh, quickly, this, this, this recovery that you saw before in growth rates, but then the, 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 it, it came again to a halt the recovery and especially what happened was that uh, the concerns or that the crisis shifted from a crisis in the banking sector mainly coming from the US to a crisis in the Euro area. And there were uh, uh, concerns about uh, individual countries in the Euro area starting with Greece and the Swiss franc started to, uh, to, to strengthen dramatically, especially in the summer of 2011. In addition, you had the first, I don't know whether you remember, what you also had in 2011 in July was the first uh, negotiations about the debt ceiling in the U.S. and the downgrading of uh, U.S. government bonds, uh, which, which also had quite an effect not so much this time around, but the first time around in 2011. So we came to a situation where the Swiss franc started to, to increase so dramatically that uh, first we tried to uh, weaken the Swiss franc or to, to just uh, basically lower again the LIBOR from 25 basis points to zero by increasing liquidity dramatically. And we had three weeks in a row where we announced uh, kind of a quantitative target. We, we announced targets for, the, for uh, the monetary base, and that helped to a certain extent. So the, the Swiss franc weakened, but then beginning September, it turned around again, and we knew that we had to come with something more dramatic. And on September 6, 2011, we came out with the following statement uh, in the morning, during trading hours, as you can imagine, there, there were a lot of discussions going on at the time at the Swiss National Bank, not only about the exact level where we would come in, but also there were some questions, what would be the effect to the market? Should we come before the market opens? Should we come during trading hours and so on? In the end, we came in during trading hours at 10 o'clock. Remember it very well. Very interesting day <laughs> for central bankers. Uh, I watched very closely the exchange rate. And I remember we came out. I think it was 10 o'clock, and this is data. As you can imagine, uh, a lot of economists at the Swiss National Bank can't wait to get a hold on that data and and do research with it because this is also this is something that is unprecedented, and the the move that we had. Uh, that we caused in the exchange rate, I was also told, is unprecedented. Uh, and there were a lot of questions whether it would be possible to move the exchange rate to that extent. Uh, especially, I mean, we had certain, Swiss National Bank didn't do that the first time. In 1978, something similar was done, but a lot of people told us, well, that was then. I mean, financial markets are much more liquid nowadays. I mean, that you cannot compare the 70s and the 2000s. And what worked in the 70s will not necessarily work now. Turned out it worked, uh, but it used a lot of more, a lot more, especially, especially later than uh, when we had to actually defend the floor. Uh, of course, the, the numbers that we had to, to use, or the, the amount of uh, money we had to use is much, much higher than whatever has been used in the 70s. But so at 10 o'clock when the announcement came out, first nothing happened. The first like half minute maybe, it 
takes time for the information to disseminate and then you start the exchange rate to start to flicker a little bit and then suddenly you had a dramatic movement then it got stuck again I mean we were around 110 maybe that morning 19 110 so we came out and said okay we do not accept anything uh, and as you can see the language was quite dramatic too last paragraph with immediate effect it will no longer tolerate a euro swiss franc exchange rate below the minimum rate of 120 uh, and the next sentence i think was important too says so will enforce this minimum rate with the utmost determination and is prepared to buy foreign currency in unlimited quantities of course that's one of the nice things if you have to defend the weakening of the exchange rate you cannot say that because you do not have unlimited quantities of foreign exchange reserves that you would need uh, that you would need to sell in the in that sense if we if we can buy foreign exchange reserves and sell swiss francs and since we can print our own uh, swiss francs we can do that in unlimited quantities technically we, we can do that there's always a question of course how large you want your balance sheet to be uh, but but technically there is there is no limit we can buy all the euros out there if necessary and basically that's what we said uh, impress the market so it went up from 110 in a short time to maybe 118 and then it got stuck there a little bit and then it went further above 120 and the whole about four minutes i think if i remember it correctly it took for the exchange rate to move from this 110 to above 120. And that worked basically without any interventions. That was just a threat that we would do it. Uh, and the markets followed. Uh, as you can see here from this um, graph, this is what happened. So when we came in is when you see the, the second peak to the low, to the down here. That's, that's basically when, it, so these were the first liquidity measures. So that helped a little bit. Then the strengthening of the Swiss franc again. Then that's when we came in with the minimum exchange rate. So we went above. And for the rest of the year, the Swiss franc uh, stayed above the floor that we had set, and we did not have to intervene. And then in 2012, in, in spring, I think it was March, April, uh, if you recall, that's when serious concerns about uh, the breakup of the Eurozone uh, emerged. And this was, there was this whole discussion about denomination risks and, and I think before it was just a crisis of individual countries of the, of the Eurozone in 2011 but in 2012 people really wondered whether the Eurozone would survive. There was talk about uh, Germany exiting and so on and so on. And that's when uh, the Swiss franc, when the, the floor, I wouldn't say got tested like some people say because basically it was just I don't think the financial markets ever doubted or wanted to test whether we could we could hold the floor it was more like let's get out of the euro so everyone went out of the euro and a lot of that came into the Swiss franc and we just had to buy up a lot but as you can see we were at the 120 basically from spring 2012 to fall 2012 and what made the difference was when Draghi came out and said we do whatever it takes to save the euro uh, and that's when the pressure immediately uh, went off of the Swiss franc and that's when we went again above first only a little bit in fall 2012 above the floor but then since the beginning of the year we are again um, I call it significantly above the floor maybe not everyone would given what we went through uh, I call it significantly above the floor, but we are clearly above the floor and we did not have to intervene since Draghi's uh, speech. So, so that the minimum exchange rate is still there, uh, but it's not binding at the moment. So we are not in the market and we do not have to defend it. Of course, the consequence of that, and especially of that phase uh, dur during 2012, when we had to, uh, to, uh, to intervene to hold the floor, uh, the consequence is that uh, we bought a lot of foreign exchange and our foreign exchange reserves uh, grew quite a bit and uh, as a result our balance sheet. But here uh, this is to point out that we are in relatively good company and that's what I meant in the beginning. Uh, other central banks did not intervene in the foreign exchange markets, they intervened in bond markets and, and other, they bought other assets. But almost all central banks increased their balance sheets quite a bit. Here's an index that starts at 100 before the crisis and you see we are, we are at the top here together with the Bank of England but you see that all other central banks, uh, Bank of England, uh, the, the Fed certainly to some extent also the ECB 
increased their balance sheets quite a bit since the beginning of the crisis. Of course, if you if you then take the balance sheet and put it into proportion to the to GDP, then then we are uh, one of the leaders here. Uh, if you don't take an index, but I think the the fact that we set the, this exchange rate floor. Uh, had immediate effect also on the economy and the graph that I usually uh, take to to show that is a leading indicator. If you look at the OECD leading indicator for the US, for the euro area and for Switzerland, then you can see coming out of the crisis, uh, the recovery in Switzerland was actually quite strong. So the leading indicator increased uh, more than that of other countries. And then in 2000, 11, when the Swiss franc started to strengthen, you see that we had, a, we had a deterioration in the leading indicator much stronger than other countries. That's clearly the effect of the strong Swiss franc. And then towards the end of 2011, uh, when we came in with this exchange rate floor, you see that immediately again the outlook for the Swiss economy changed and stabilized again uh, the economic outlook. So this, I think, is a, is a for me, one of the best pictures to prove that the exchange rate floor really uh, worked and was the decisive factor to, uh, to stabilize the Swiss economy. But you also see that the situation was very special is when you look at, uh, at a government uh, bond yields at the short term. I mean, we had, during 2012, you had phases where they were negative up to two years I think at one stage even up to five years. But the three months uh, government bonds uh, have been issued, not just traded, issued at, with a negative interest rates since, uh, since we came in in 2011. This is, I think, a very, I mean, you are the specialists on this, but I always have a hard time explaining people why someone would pay money to lend money. Uh, so, I mean, this is still something that has to find its way into textbooks. And the only explanations, you maybe have better explanations, but the only explanations I have why someone would actually buy something with a negative interest rate is that on the one hand, there was at least during 2011, there were talks that uh, some investors, especially hedge funds, uh, were so worried about credit risks that they preferred to buy a government bond with negative interest rates rather than put the money into a bank at the zero interest rates, but with a large credit risk. So that was one of the stories, but that cannot be true for the entire um, period. And the other, of course, is that just cash has been so plenty uh, that government bonds uh, as a use for collateral and, and other purposes has been more valuable than cash. But still, it's a very, very special situation. And you see, it's still ongoing. So the government is still issuing three month bonds at the negative interest rates at this stage, which shows you that the situation is still uh, quite, quite special. I mean, also long uh, term interest rates have been extremely low. And you see, especially also again for the period uh, 2012, when we had to intervene, uh, the Swiss uh, long term interest rates were even below the one of Japan. Uh, now, recently, with the, the start of the discussion about the tapering, interest rates started to increase again, but they are still at the extremely uh, low level. And what also shows you a little bit the special situation in Switzerland, and I think something that, in my view, I always use when, when the question comes up, yeah, why does Switzerland, why did you need this uh, uh, exchange rate floor? Wasn't it a little bit extreme? If you look at the export sector, it's not doing that, uh, that badly and so on. I think uh, what clearly uh, is a difference to other countries is that we actually had negative inflation. So we had we had a deflation going on also since the introduction of this uh, foreign exchange floor. Swiss inflation rates have been negative. <coughs> they have now come back after almost two years to about zero, but the, the recent uh, inflation data again has, uh, has been uh, negative. So we have been, we had a considerable period of negative, in, uh, negative inflation. Now you may, you may say, well, this is also true for other countries in 2009, but I think the story in 2009 was quite different. That's when the Great Recession, when we had the big shock. The 2009 negative 
uh, inflation rates are mainly a story of, uh, of falling oil prices, falling food prices. You also see that in other countries. And here I have this graph to show you the difference. You have uh, not only headline inflation, but you also have core inflation, which uh, takes these effects of uh, oil and volatile food prices and so out, the green and the blue. Uh, line here and you see in 2009 they are not negative but uh, the difference is in 2011 2012 they are negative core inflation is negative too so it's not a story here of oil prices falling like it is in 2009 but it's uh, it's uh, a much broader uh, fall in in the price level and this is different from other countries uh, as you can see you had uh, uh, now recently falling inflation rates too in the euro area and in the US but uh, apart from Japan which has uh, since quite a while this problem of, uh, of uh, deflation uh, Switzerland was also uh, very uh, different here from other countries. Now what about the export story? A lot of times uh, we are told well uh, Swiss uh, so, so I show that also because this was a, a very important motive. Uh, I showed you in the beginning our definition of price stability. It's anywhere between zero and two percent. So below zero is not acceptable. It's not called price stability. So the measure itself, uh, I think, can be very well justified just by the fact that we had negative inflation. And to prevent a deflationary spiral, uh, we had to become much more expansionary than we could be with zero interest rates. So the, and given that the problem in Switzerland was specifically a problem of a very strong exchange rate, uh, which was clearly not in line with fundamentals uh, at, uh, during the crisis, to set this cap or this floor was, was the way to go. Now, if you look, what did it for the, for the export industry? Then you can see that uh, in the aggregate, uh, it, looks, it looks actually quite good. Exports, imports, you have the dip there during the, uh, 2009. And then you have the recovery. And uh, basically, we are again in the aggregate uh, at or above, uh, above the level that we had uh, before the crisis. But if you, if you now go into the individual industries, the picture is a little bit different. What's, what, what is really special uh, about the export industry during the recent uh, crisis has been that it's very much driven by very specific sectors, watches uh, and uh, pharma industry. Watches a lot has a lot to do with the increasing wealth in the emerging economies, which have not been hit so much by the Great Recession. And there are some special factors, special effects going on in the pharma industry. But if you look at the individual industries, then you see that, uh, uh, for instance, for metals and for machinery, they have not reached yet, uh, again, the level that they had before the crisis. Uh, actually, for instance, machinery in green is uh, somewhere around the lowest level that, that, it, that, that there was during the Great Recession. So, so in the aggregate, it doesn't look too bad uh, if, you, if you go into the individual industries, the picture is, is quite, uh, quite a different one. And uh, currently, the situation also is so that we still have a, a negative output gap. So uh, even though the recovery is ongoing, it's a relatively weak uh, recovery. And we are clearly not, uh, the Swiss economy is clearly not working yet at, at its full capacity. You have three different measures here of, uh, of an output gap, showing you how far away that we are still from using the full capacity of the Swiss economy. And I think here, what this picture shows you, uh, that a th uh, an additional factor that comes in, why the Swiss uh, recovery, or why, why the Swiss economy looks relatively healthy or strong if you, if you just take this uh, very broad view. And it has a lot to do with immigration. Immigration was relatively strong in Switzerland. That is also a, a very special uh, situation, uh, or has been a very special situation over the last years. And that strengthened uh, consumption quite a bit. If you would look at, uh, at uh, GDP per capita, the situation uh, looks much worse than GDP uh, in the aggregate. And you can also see it here with output gap. Uh, and the, the, the red and the, 
yellow line are, are, are simple filtering methods where you just take a trend, while the uh, blue one uses the production function that takes this immigration into consideration. And you see there that the output gap, if you take this uh, measure, is much uh, larger than if you just take a simple filter. That the output gap is still negative, you can also see uh, by the fact that unemployment is still increasing. I mean, it's nothing dramatic compared with, uh, with other countries. But uh, we are reaching now slowly the peak, but it has still been increasing, uh, showing or another another uh, evidence for a negative output gap. And you can also see it in the inflation forecast. That's our latest inflation forecast uh, from September. The next one will come out in uh, December. But you see that, uh, and here the red one is, is, the, is the most recent one. You see that even, and that's a conditional forecast, which has been done uh, with the assumption that interest rates stay at zero for the next three years. So even if interest rates would stay uh, at zero for the next three years, our models do not predict inflation to rise much about above 1%. So it's extremely low inflation environment, so there is no inflationary risk uh, inside uh, in the foreseeable future. Now, some may have seen this morning in the NZZ, we talked about it quickly, uh, some articles uh, about uh, this unconventional monetary policy. Uh, Professor Waldensberger is one of them. And of course, there are concerns about uh, the, the fact that this unconventional, which has, been, which has been going on now since two to three years, depending on what you look at, uh, becomes the new conventional, which is clearly not the idea. But there are, there are worries about side effects. And one such worry we have been uh, a lot of times um, voicing as well, and that's the housing market. Uh, that this very low interest rate environment is stimulating uh, the housing market uh, to, ex to an extent that uh, might not be healthy. And I took here uh, a graph of, uh, of uh, prices, house prices, apartment prices, and I on purpose took a longer series uh, to show you the last housing crisis we had, uh, end of the 80s, 90s. And if you compare the two graphs, then it's quite scary uh, that that uh, we are in the same region. Now you can, of course, come with a lot of uh, arguments why it's different this time. <laughs> we all know this. Uh, you can, and immigration is one of these factors that you have some clear uh, fundamental demand for uh, housing for apartments. But, but the, the price increase has been quite dramatic. And this is one of the reasons uh, why we have voiced concerns and asked for additional instruments, uh, given that um, I mean, one of the big discussions before the crisis, uh, as you as you probably know, it has been: uh, should the central bank react to to uh, excesses on asset markets with interest rate policy? And the clear uh, common wisdom before the crisis was: no, that's not that's not what the central bank should do. It can actually make things worse. Uh, first of all, central banks do not really know when bubbles develop. No one can tell when a bubble uh, is on the way. You can tell it with hindsight, but not before, and certainly not in real time. Uh, and uh, interest rates are not the right instrument. They are too blunt an instrument to, 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 to uh, try to uh, deflate the bubble. And a lot of times, if you try to deflate the bubble, you cause, you cause, uh, you cause havoc. Uh, and you might cause a problem that, that wouldn't have existed otherwise. Now, after and, and so the, the, the common wisdom was the Greenspan doctrine, which was uh, clean up after the crisis. Uh, don't do anything while it happens, when, while the bubble is ongoing, but you clean up after the crisis by lowering your interest rates. That's basically what central banks followed. Uh, it became now evident that this cleaning up bill can be quite, quite expensive. Uh, and the, there has been a lot of thinking going on about uh, should, should central banks not do something uh, already do, uh, during the bubble. And I think th th there is still no uh, common view out there. Some, some central banks are more of the view that interest rate should be used. Uh, for instance, if you look at statements of the Bank of Sweden recently, or even the, or the Central Bank of Canada, they hinted to the fact that they would increase interest rates, the Bank of Canada, or that they would not lower interest rates like the Bank of Sweden because of the concerns on the housing market. 
Other central banks, and we are more in this camp, think that uh, interest rates should be reserved for price stability, but we need additional instruments uh, to, to deal with these issues uh, in the housing markets. And that's why we asked Parliament to, to give us this counter-cyclical capital buffer, which uh, we did receive and we already activated uh, in February. And I think history will show whether uh, this is enough or whether we need uh, additional instruments and whether we can actually avoid another crisis as we had it uh, in, in the late 80s, beginning 90s. But all in all, I think uh, if you uh, would ask me what is the main job of central banks, then I think Alice Rivlin uh, had the best uh, attempted that, so the job of central bank is to worry, and in that sense I think um, if you would uh, conclude what's the, what's the approach to monetary policy with national bank, I think it's a very yeah. pragmatic, in a sense, pragmatic way and, and a very risk-oriented way in the sense that we are not claiming that we can fine-tune the economy, but that we can try to, uh, to address the biggest shocks and try to take the biggest risks out of the economy. We have done that with the exchange rate floor and we usually do that uh, with uh, setting our uh, uh, LIBOR interest rates in a way to, to, to prevent uh, inflation which or inflationary uh, developments that would uh, be harmful to the Swiss economy. Thank you very much. If you have any questions, I'm uh, happy to try to answer them. than it is right now. No, of course, I mean, this is, a, a, uh, this is almost in, impossible to, to answer. We have, of course, several equilibrium models at the Swiss National Bank, but they all tell me something different. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a little bit actually like we do our inflation forecast. We are, unlike other central banks, some other central banks have one uh, model that they use for inflation forecasts. We have a whole series of models. And the same is true for the equilibrium exchange rate. And we have a whole series of models that tell us different things and we, we get a range. Uh, so I would say at the moment, and that's also what we publicly say, the Swiss franc is still overvalued, it's still very strong. But I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't dare to give you an exact, uh, <laughs> exact rate. Uh, what sort of external pressures are you facing um, I mean, uh, of those sectors uh, saying you that you are one of the biggest currency manipulators of the world? No, that was a big issue in, uh, well, I mean a big issue. We, we clearly uh, were uh, aware of this, these issues and, and there were some claims especially coming from the United States, Peterson Institute, saying that we are the, the biggest uh, currency manipulator. Um, what always helped, I think, I mean, we, the, we explained our situation at the BIS, that's one of these uh, forums that you can explain it to our central banks, and I think it was always well understood. Also in the IMF uh, Article 4, I think we, we clearly could show that our situation is different, and one of the reasons was, as I showed, that we actually had negative inflation. You have the Federal Reserve or other central banks worrying when inflation falls to 1%. Uh, they already say then, well, we, there's a big risk that we fall into deflation. We had deflation. And so in that sense, it was very clear that we had to do something. Uh, also, I think if you look at the movement of the exchange rate, it is pretty clear that, that, that it was extreme in 2011 and we are still uh, significantly above the long-term average so I think that's another argument that we usually where was that oh, no, right. that we usually use to to defend the position so the Swiss franc is clearly strong if you take a, a simple average instead of a equilibrium model um, and then uh, what it especially also used in the US and at the Peterson Institute, and that's why Thomas Jordan gave the speech in, uh, at, during the spring meetings recently, uh, 
it's difficult to understand or what, what, what we are usually told is that you have such a large current account surplus in Switzerland. How is it possible that you have an overvalued or a strong Swiss franc and at the same time a very strong current account surplus? And I think what's, what's, what, what we try to explain and I hope successfully is that unlike in other countries like Germany or China where the biggest part of this current account surplus is a trade surplus, this is not the case in Switzerland that our current account surplus almost moves independently of the exchange rate. So we have a lot of income in there, investment income. Uh, we have things in there like carry trade, a lot of items that are not dependent on the exchange rate. So even if the Swiss franc would strengthen uh, another 50 or 60 percent, the current account surplus would not move much. So these are other factors. And, and we had to explain this situation, but I think overall, overall it was very well understood. And the criticism hasn't been too, too uh, harsh. Uh, not necessarily. I think we started quite early. I mean, it was clear to us that we, when we had to intervene, we bought the uh, euros. Uh, but uh, we also didn't want to have uh, only euros on the on the balance sheet. I think the diversification was more uh, more an issue of asset management uh, than an issue of the monetary policy stance. Or, uh, or uh, of course, it will it will uh, help uh, probably. Uh, once we exit, depending a little bit how the exchange rate moves, but it was more uh, an issue of asset management. And as you said, we started to diversify. I think one uh, advantage that we have over some other central banks is that, again, here we have a very flexible framework when it comes to asset management. There are other central banks that can only buy government bonds, and that has not been the case in, the, in Switzerland for quite a while. So we can buy not only government bonds, we can also buy stocks, shares, equity shares, we can buy corporate bonds. And so we used all of that, and in addition to that, we started to diversify into other currencies, and we, especially into Asian currencies. Uh, uh, but also, also other smaller uh, currencies. So there has been an ongoing process, just in a sense of, uh, of good practice of asset management to diversify your, uh, your assets. Thank you.